So guys, quickly the overviews, uh, use cases, basic types, and uh, sample clustering stuff. Custom distance measure. We will understand what is the distance measure and uh, how to define it. Oh, okay, anyhow, we know uh, distance measure, so we'll try to understand you know, what is custom distance measure and how to implement it. So K-means clustering algorithm representing data as a vector, transforming data into vectors. And again, uh, clustering document. Lucene analyzes top words. I will look at uh, top words and TF idea, term frequency and inverse document frequency and weights. Ngram collocation and uh, normalization and k-means execution using through full command line operations and finally visualizing clusters using certain uh, APIs available in Mahout and then displaying k-means cluster dumper. Okay, finally we will look at uh, I mean, cluster dumper is an utility to actually analyze the outputs generated by any most of the algorithms in Mahout guys and finally we will look at uh, limitations of k-means as well close to our end of the discussion okay so guys uh, here are a few use cases which I try to pick up uh, specifically for the clustering guys okay so there is a third party vendor called as Gizmetrics. so basically this company masters in generating customer specific insights Okay, so they do lots of clustering based on, you know, a lot of aspects of uh, customers. I mean, they actually come up with uh, different groups of customers so that they can, uh, so that the users can rightly target the customers based upon the customer groups. So how they'll come up with the customer groups? Instead of, uh, in, in an in traditional approach, usually what, uh, I mean, usually what businesses will do is uh, they actually look at the customer profile like uh, customer geographic location customer social status and few other aspects of customer through which they'll try to come up with the groups and they'll try to target the customers using those ca different categories or using those different groups but however since the evolution of uh, you know uh, internet, social media, and a lot more stuff. Application uh, pro, uh, analyzing the customers using application clickstream logs. So based on clickstream logs, social media, and some other stuff, you know, these guys have come up with a very, um, very niche uh, way of identifying the groups based on all these aspects, guys. So if you look at uh, this specific slide, you guys can see that uh, they have actually mind certain data out of the customer behavior like uh, uh, in general you know where the customers are coming from I mean from which application the customers are directly launching logging into your application or uh, visited sites and signed up when did uh, the user signed up and uh, enter checkout see users can actually for instance if it's an e-commerce kind of application the major problem of e-commerce uh, domain is people do log into the uh, e-commerce websites and they do look at the products and they do prepare the carts. But, but just before checking out the cart, pe most of uh, you know users actually will uh, uh, skip from that step. So they'll try to analyze understand why users are preparing the uh, preparing up coming up to prepare a preparation of the cart and from finally they'll the upscan so they so they'll try to mine all these things even using all these uh, different parameters guys and finally purchased I mean you guys can also see so the number of users visiting say for a particular time interval is around 2615 but the the users who are really signing up into the application are drastically reduced. You can say almost 33% of the actual number of uh, uh, users who was actually visiting the site. And they're again checking out. I mean, the number of users who really prepared the cart is not even close to 50%. It's like almost 379, like four, 400 approximately. And uh, here, 
the actual users getting converged are very very less like 67 percentage so 2.6 percentage out of the actual number of users visiting the website so here the purpose of doing seg uh, clustering i mean uh, purpose of doing clustering of uh, the customers or customer segmentation both one and the same segmenting the customers is to actually bring up the number of the, to actually bring up the percentage of conversion uh, conversions happening over the website when i say conversions i mean through the entire uh, i mean until the user makes some transactions we can say it is as a conversion for uh, specifically for e-commerce kind of applications guys and as i already mentioned uh, these guys you know leverage on various advanced data sets to actually come up with the customer segment Okay, so let's move further. And uh, we, I have uh, picked up another few examples. Like uh, Twitter is one of the well-known example. So basically, Twitter also does customer segmentation. Uh, they uh, they do a lot of stuff. They they do customer segmentation. They might do uh, the tweet segmentation for identifying the trends within the tweets uh, and few other uh, stuff also specific to you know, clustering. If you look at the Twitter, so here is some uh, information about the Twitter itself. However, I'm sure that pretty much everyone might be knowing about the Twitter. So Twitter also does uh, customer segmentation or tweet segmentation based on various uh, various uh, seg various data sets, folks. And uh, here it says like uh, Twitter is a social networking website and the micro blogging service where people broadcast short public messages known as tweets, and uh, these tweets are at most 140 characters long and once posted a tweet is instantly published on the feed of all the for all the users who are following and is visible publicly over the twitter site and uh, these tweets are sometimes annotated with keywords as uh, in the style of hash so if you wanted to highlight your tweet to a specific category they can highlight that uh, tweet using uh, i mean sorry they can highlight the tweet for based on specific keywords which are more relevant to what you were actually talking about and that uh, keywords you can use like uh, hash uh, okay are marked as uh, directed at at another user with syntax like okay so at the rate so if you want to direct it uh, for another users you can just use at the rate symbol so that it will be directed to that specific user So last but not the least, uh, we do have uh, another third party vendor called us Data Mining Lab. So this Data Mining Lab also does uh, different, uh, diff I mean, also solve different problems using, you know, clustering aspects using by running the unsupervised learning techniques. So here you can see, you know, for Edureka itself, we have picked up uh, an, uh, an example over here. So maybe Edureka also might want to understand you know different customers so they also come up with the, uh, the clustering so that they can rightly target the ads you can see you know different ads have been targeted for the users based on different groups so this however will cover in detail when we look at uh, uh, recommendations framework i mean uh, how we can target uh, users based on the based on clustering of the users okay so that that's an another you know uh, very uh, very general way of targeting the customers so that probably will go into the deeper understanding of that over the recommendations uh, sessions guys okay so folks let's start with uh, you know uh, that's pretty much about you know different use cases of uh, clustering and however we either knowing or unknowingly you guys might be uh, using clustering with done you know from various uh, products for example if you guys might be using some google news kind of stuff they also do clustering over the news articles as well guys so guys anyhow so enough uh, of uh, examples and all that stuff so let's quickly proceed and try to understand you know the basics of clustering first and then i'll introduce you guys to k-means clustering algorithm along with how the k-means clustering algorithm works and then move on the guys. Okay. So, for, oops, 
clustering basics. Uh, so here is some you know, so some content which I have prepared so to just make you understand what is clusters clustering. So guys, we do have uh, different clusters. In this image, you guys can see that there are three different clusters: cluster zero, two, and cluster one. So based on certain characteristics, we have actually classified all these things into different groups, guys. Okay. The major, I mean, the most, uh, the key metric which is used to identify the similar items is going to be the distance measure specific to clustering algorithms as opposed to, okay, correlation, I mean, similarity by correlation in recommendations. We do have two different metrics. One is similarity by distance and the other one is similarity by correlation. So here, clustering algorithms majorly depend on similarity by distance, but various the recommendation algorithms will depend on similarity by correlation. So that probably will take it up later. Let's try to understand uh, how clusters will be formed using this uh, distance metric. So cluster analysis or clustering is a task of grouping a set of objects in such a way that the objects in the same group, so the objects within the same group are treated as a cluster are more similar and the objects within a cluster are more similar in some sense or another. So in some or the other way, the objects of a group are more similar than that of the objects in the other groups to each other than those of the other groups, guys. Other groups are clusters, so both are one and the same again. Okay. So let's consider this uh, small example before we look at the uh, no, actual clustering algorithms. So guys, I have a question for you here on this slide. So you guys should understand this question. I mean, you guys should treat this slide from right to left, but not left to right. So starting from uh, here. So guys, if assume that if you were a librarian, okay, and you were given with some corpus of books like this. So I have given you some corpus of books and I actually asked you to you guys to come up with different categories within the books. I want I wanted you guys to actually group the books based on certain similarity similarities. So guys, can you please tell me what will be your approach to actually categorize the books or else to actually group the books into different clusters. So based on so we'll just exclude publications and then consider only author and subject, maybe the name of the book. Guys, do you remember in the, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about one issue if you really look at uh, you know, only subject part of the book. And then, so usually, you know, in general, if you were given the books, so you can look at various parameters like uh, who is the author of the book and what is the title of the book and probably the content within the book and you manually try to read the content and try to come up with the groupings of the books based on either title or you know the actual content within the books itself. So you identify different groups like say cultural, law books, religious, science books and then you can be able to categorize them properly with this groupings. So let's see if there are any problems with the uh, certain approaches. So before we look at the problem, so why text clustering? So when we are doing text clustering, why we need to really leverage on Mahout? And let's see what is the importance of Mahout in case of text clustering. So guys, if you look at the web, 25 billion web pages have been indexed by Google search engine. Okay, so Google search engine alone has indexed approximately around 25 billion web pages. Okay, over the web, throughout the web. So if you consider such massive data sets, 25 billion web pages. Okay, so doing 
I mean, running some kind of clustering algorithms over such massive data sets could be a nightmare with traditional tools, guys. So that's where Mahout really comes into picture. Since Mahout has got scalable clustering and classification algorithms as opposed to that of other tools where they can run on the standalone environments. And estimated text data set size is more than petabyte. So here I'm just taking an example of, uh, you know, to letting you know about the size of the data sets, which is approximately around a petabyte. And uh, needs scalable and scalable clustering and classification algorithms to implement such kind of massive clustering over there. So that's where Mahout comes into picture. So types of clustering. So guys, Mahout offers variety of algorithms to run the clustering over your data sets. So the variety of clustering algorithms Mahout offers is K-means is one of the most popular learning techniques. And then fuzzy K-means, canopy clustering, hierarchical clustering, and then LDA. LDA is very interesting category, I mean, interesting type of clustering algorithms, which is also considered as probabilistic clustering techniques, considered under probabilistic clustering techniques. And however, LDA stands for latent directional allocation. But in Mahout 0.9, they have deprecated LDA. In the place of LDA, they have released another algorithm called as CVB. CVB stands for complement, sorry, Collapsed variational base. Okay, so instead of LDA, we'll cover CVB in the tomorrow's session, folks. So we'll cover many of these algorithms in tomorrow's session. Fuzzy K means canopy, what is hierarchical, what is LDA. And today, our point of discussion is going to be K means clustering technique. So, folks, again, uh, let's consider another use case here. Let's try to, considering these are different movies I have given it to you and our say books which I have given it to you and let's try to cluster these books based on the titles. So guys, if, if I ask you guys to actually come up with groups based on the titles, can you tell me how many groups you should be able to find out and in each group what, uh, what will be the books? In each book, so you will end up identifying two categories or two groups within your input data set. And if you look at the cluster one, you have the Harry Potter series, and in the cluster two, you have Lord of the Rings. But are these really, is this a right way to, do, to come up with the clustering, guys? Because if you look at these three books, you guys can easily say that all these three belong to only one cluster or one group because all these three movies are fiction in nature. So they're all fiction movies. So in such a scenario, so we should actually group all these entities into one group, but we have identified two groups. The reason behind that is, so the major, I mean, the core way to come up with the clusters is mainly depends upon the parameters which you choose to run your algorithm. Here, the bottom parameter which we have chosen is only title. So since we have chosen title, so that's why we have found out two categories over here. Instead of title, if we could have focused on the actual content of the book itself, then probably we could have ended up coming up with only single group within the data set, guys. So here, all that I wanted to say is, if you select the garbage parameters to do the to run the algorithms, then whatever you are going to get is the garbage as the output. Okay, so you should be very careful about the feature selection. So you should select the right features to run the algorithm based on your requirement. If you choose wrong features, you will end up creating 
incorrect clusters okay so since we clustered them on books titles hence lord of the rings went into other cluster even though it belongs to the same genre and then ideally it should have also come it should also come in cluster 1 as all the three books are based on fiction hence our clustering technique should go through the contents of the books rather than the titles of the book books themselves okay Okay, so guys, what is clustering? Okay. So in general, what is clustering, guys? So guys, clustering is a technique to identify groups, clusters within the input observations in such a way that the objects within the group will have high similarities and less similarities between other groups or clusters. So Clustering is basically is nothing but grouping into different clusters, okay, or else identifying groups. But however, each group element should be most similar in nature compared to that of the other groups, guys. Okay? So that's the basic rule which it has to satisfy. And which of the below similarity metrics are used in clustering algorithm? So, guys, can you please let me know which of the similar similarity metrics are used in clustering algorithms. Is it similarity by correlation or is it distance measures? So guys, as I said just before, even though there are two metrics to identify similarities, in clustering algorithms, we will be leveraging on distance measures only. Similarity by correlation is not used in clustering algorithms rather that will be used in recommendation algorithms guys in the recommendations framework similarity by correlation here the major metric we will be using is going to be the distance measures in clustering algorithms okay is it clear everyone so guys here let's see uh, first of all let's try to identify let's try to understand what is k-means clustering algorithms algorithm and then uh, how to come up with the value of k for the k-means clustering algorithm guys okay. so k-means clustering algorithm actually stands for k k actually stands for k number of clusters okay and this k value has to be manually supplied by the users based upon the need okay it's based upon the input data sets you are dealing with you have to identify the k value to come up with k groups from your k means clustering algorithm okay and that k value has to be manually supplied so let's try to understand some you know some vague logic how to identify the k value see guys but even though it's a vague logic but it definitely works fine in our case i'll tell you why so in general it, it works very fine and k-means clustering generates a specific number of disjoint flat non-hierarchical clusters okay so when i say k-means clustering generates specific number of clusters so it will generate k clusters and they are disjoint in nature okay they are flat and i mean flat non-hierarchical clusters so when I say disjoint, if a given point goes to a specific cluster, it will never go to another cluster, guys. So uh, any given point can belong to only one cluster within the k-means clustering algorithm. So that's why I'm calling it as k-means generate disjoint clusters. Each point can go to only one cluster and flat. Flat means there are no hierarchies defined within the clusters. The, cl the clusters are absolutely independent of each other. There is no hierarchies between the, th there is no relationship between the clusters themselves, guys. So these two aspects, I mean, these are the two um, features of K-means clustering algorithm. And then, it is well suited for generating global R clusters. 
So when I say globular clusters, which means that the size of the clusters will be approximately the same. Not exactly the same, but approximately if you look at the clusters being generated, the sizes of the clusters could be approximately same. So that's why we are calling it as globular clusters, guys. And they are uniform in nature. I mean, the clusters formed will have similar shapes also. So that's why I'm calling it as globular clusters. Don't worry. Even if you do not understand what is globular clusters, that's absolutely fine. Just try to understand the term. That's it. Try to grab the term globular clusters. Throughout, the, I mean, by the end of the session, definitely I'll guarantee you that you will understand you know, all these terms. And then uh, the K-means method is numerical, unsupervised learning technique, non-deterministic, and iterative in nature. So basically, K-means algorithm is... It is a kind of numerical, It's an, it falls under unsupervised learning techniques and it is non-deterministic and iterative. So let's discuss about non-deterministic later, but iterative at least stands for the algorithm goes in n number of iterations to identify K clusters. So as I already said, one of the key limitations, I mean one of the key aspects of K means is user has to manually supply the K value to the algorithm to come up with K clusters within the input data set. Okay, how to identify the, how to decide the value of K. Let's try to understand. So if you were given around like 1 million news articles, then you were asked to identify K value. Assuming that 500 news articles about every unique story. Assuming that there are approximately 500 articles talking about a specific topic, okay, or specific story. Then, considering 1 million news articles and in which 500, every 500 are talking to specific topic, then the way we come up with the K value is it's by dividing the number of news articles divided by the this value, which is 500. Okay, so 1 million divided by 500 is approximately how much? It is approximately around 2,000 guys. So you should start your clustering with a K value of about 2,000. So you can just use 2,000 as the K value so that the algorithm will come up with 2000 groups within your data set. So you guys can analyze those 2000 groups and then probably can find you this value of K by running it for further iterations and for further fine tuning. So anyhow, however, even though it's a crude way of estimating the number of clusters, Nevertheless, the K-means algorithm generates decent clustering even with this approximation, even though we are approximating the K-value. But still, this mechanism works very fine, I mean, works very well in terms of finding out the clusters within the data set using K-means algorithm, guys. So before we actually understand, I mean, however, we don't, we didn't actually go on through how K-means works. We just under, try to understand some high-level uh, features of k-means like in k-means user has to supply the k value and it will come up with the k clusters and it is disjoint uh, it actually provides you disjoint clusters where the points are uh, belong to points will belong to only one cluster and then uh, they are non-hierarchical and they are like uh, um, iterate, I mean k-means algorithm is iterative in nature so all these properties we actually identified so far so before we understand, you know, the actual way of uh, how the K-means works. So first, let's uh, reiterate what is centroid. Guys, if you could remember, already we discussed about centroid in the very first session. But I just wanted to recap uh, the concept of centroid because that's what we'll be using over here. So basically, centroid is a position within a circle where you can be, where it's a, 
actual center point of that entire circuit is. For example, if you take this image over here, if you take this uh, plate or saucer over here, so if you point your finger to the exactly the central position of this saucer, then this saucer should be able to balance throughout this. So that position where uh, the finger is pointing, that position is called as centroid. But to, for the sake of simplicity, a centroid is nothing but an average, basically, average of multiple points. If you look at this below image, you guys can see there are three points, A, B, C. So if you find out the centroid for A, B, C, the centroid for A, B, C will be in the center position over here. If you find out the centroid for A and B, so the centroid for A and B is lying over here. So centroid for B and C lies over here. Centroid for A and C lies over here. So it's nothing but the average of the points within the data set. So that is called as centroid for the sake of simplicity. And then the centroid or geometric center of the two dimensional region is informally the point at which the cardboard cutout of a region could be perfectly balanced on the tip of a pencil, assuming uniform density and uniform gravitational field. And formally, the centroid of a plane a uh, figure of two-dimensional shape is arithmetic mean. So in general, the centroid is nothing but the arithmetic average, guys. I mean, which is mean. Average also is called as mean sometimes. And position of all the points within the shape. So average of all the points within the shape. And then the definition extends to any object in any dimensional space. Its centroid is mean position of all the points in the uh, in all of the coordinate directions. So basically, centroid, uh, centroid can be found out for n-dimensional, I mean n-dimensional space also where the points are distributed over the n-dimensional space. So the centroid should be calculated with all these points and all the features, all the coordinates. Okay. So folks, let me try to explain you how the k-means clustering algorithm works so that uh, it will give us the better understanding on uh, different types of algorithms guys. So guys, k-means clustering algorithm is actually treated as EM algorithm guys. Okay, what what is EM? EM actually stands for expectation and maximization. Okay. EM actually stands for expectation and maximization. So K-means is one of such algorithms which fall under the category of EM kind of algorithms. Okay, I think you guys might have confused. So let me clear that for you. Let me give more, more detailed information about that. So for that, it's necessary that we should understand how the K-means algorithm works. So through which we'll understand why it is said to be the EM kind of algorithm. So guys, what I'm, guys, all of you, please pay attention over here. So this is very interesting and important topic for, topic of discussion for today. Okay, if you miss this, it's absolutely, uh, you know, meaningless. So please pay your attention over here. Okay. So guys, now what I will do is I will take some sample data set and we'll try to come up with clusters by applying the k-means clustering algorithm over here. Okay. So for that, what I'll do is I'll consider a two-dimensional plane in this case. So just like this. Okay. I'm taking a two-dimensional plane, guys. It could be, of course, it could be n-dimensional plane. Since I cannot represent n-dimensional plane over here, I'm just taking two-dimensional plane, guys. But you guys can feel free to imagine it as a n-dimensional plane. So a two-dimensional plane, I can consider x and y axis. So considering this as, say, x axis, and then we also have y axis over here. Okay. Then we do have origin also at this stage, at this position. 
I think everyone will under, should understand all these things. So, okay. So there is the origin. So, guys, considering a two-dimensional plane, what I would do now is I will distribute the points over the two-dimensional plane. Okay, something like this. So I'm just randomly picking some observations, guys. Okay. So to differentiate, I'm picking different colors. Okay. However, it does not matter. Okay. Then let me take. So guys, I am trying to explain how the k-means algorithm works by taking a sample data set over two-dimensional plane like this. Okay, so guys, consider this as the case and now the points are distributed say in this fashion in your two-dimensional plane. Let's try to apply the step-by-step -step approach of k-means algorithm over this data set and try to understand all the aspects of k-means okay guys in k-means the first step k-means clustering algorithm would do is immediately when you supply the input data set to be clustered so here these all the points are actually the input data set to your k-means algorithm okay then also you since you have to supply the k value so assuming that here i have supplied the k value as 3 to this data set so let me write it down over here so since i am manually supplying i am actually running k means algorithm okay and then i have supplied k value as 3 assume that i have supplied k value as 3 in this case so let's try to see how this algorithm operates on this input data set guys so the first step k means algorithm would do is it will randomly identify k centroids within the given points okay it will randomly pick up k centroids within the available data sets so randomly, if we consider, say, this as one centroid, okay, and this as another centroid, and say, this point as another centroid. How many centroids it will pick up? It has to pick up three centroids because the K value is three. And how is it picking up those centroids? It purely random in nature, okay? So once it has picked up this k random centroids from the given data set then let's see how k means clustering algorithm works to come up with k clusters within the given data set guys so the first thing what it would do is okay so the first uh, first step what it would do is it will identify the nearest points from each of these centroids. Okay, so guys, let's see now. So, considering these are different centroids, the first step what it do is, it will iterate through all the points within the two-dimensional plane and will identify the distance between the point and the centroids and will assign the point to the centroid which is close to the which is close to the centroid so when i say it will iterate through all the points let's take each one of these points and try to understand so consider that if it has taken this as one point now okay then what it will do is it will pick this point and it will identify the distance 
don't worry how the distance will be calculated at this point in time just by looking at this uh, two dimensional plane you guys can understand that this point is very close to this okay so just try to assume that so if this it will identify the distance between this this centroid and this centroid as well as this centroid so all the three centroid it has identified the distance so which of the centroids is close to this particular point guys so the centroid which is close to this point is this one so it will assign this point to this centroid and in the same way it will iterate through the remaining points for instance now it identifies the distance of this point with this and this and all the three centroids so it has identified that this is the closest centroid for this point so it will assign this point to this centroid and at the same time if it comes over here so what will happen so this point will get assigned to this guy okay so if it comes to this point so all the points will be covered however i'm just randomly picking so it will just come in uh, it will identify the distance of all the points so if it tries to identify the distance of this point with all these three centroids it will obviously assign this point to this centroid okay so like that all the points in the first iteration will get assigned to any one of this given random centroids so finally once the first iteration is done in the expectation step okay let me first okay so this step is called as expectation step so in expectation step what is happening is each point will be assigned to a nearest centroid within the available data set so if you consider this the clusters would be formed could be something like this let me show it over here so the clusters would have been formed something like okay so maybe something like this let's see so after the first iteration i would say the clusters are formed something like this because these points are close to this centroid and these all these points are close to this one and all these points are close to this one so that's why the clusters will be formed something like this after the first iteration then this iteration this step is called as expectation step okay then after the expectation step there will be a maximization step okay maximization step so in the maximization step what happens is these cluster centroids will be recalculated okay the cluster centroids will be recalculated if you recalculate the cluster centroid for all these points guys if you are finding out the average of all these points what could be the probable point where you end up so ideally you might end up with this say point as the centroid now so let me take another color here hopefully you will end up identifying the new centroid for this cluster which should be this centroid and if you identify the centroid for this whole cluster group then probably you might end up identifying a centroid somewhere here okay which is the average of all these points and then for this cluster if you identify the if you identify the centroid you so you might end up finding out a centroid somewhere over here it's nothing but finding out the average of all these points so finding out the average of all these points so finding out the average of all these points so the centroids are recalculated in the maximization step guys so now your cluster centroids are what not this blue ones instead your cluster centroids have been changed so this is one of your cluster centroid now this is another cluster centroid and now this is another cluster centroid so this happens in the maximization step 
So after the maximization step is completed, this whole process will go in iteration. So this whole process, expectation step and maximization step will go in iteration, guys. So then if you go back to expectation step once again, so, so what will you do? Again, you will iterate through all the available points within the given data set and will try to map the points to the closest centroid. So if you do that in the next expectation step, I mean in the second iteration, you probably will end up identifying the clusters something like this considering this as the centroid and probably these are the points which will belong to this new centroid and probably here there won't be any changes so in this case there might not be any changes in this case so this is in the second expectation step i mean in the second iteration then what happens is the same thing again you will do maximization step so in the maximization step again nothing again you will recalculate the centroid so if you recalculate the centroid again so hopefully the centroid from here because now the points have changed if you identify the mean of all these points the centroid might flip might change from this position to somewhere this position okay so this one could become your centroid now and here your centroid might switch from this position to somewhere over here and this there won't be any change because already it looks like this is the centroid there won't be much change in the centroid within this given points guys so it might change very little bit so a little bit here or here so assuming that it might change somewhere over here but there won't be too much of change in this case because already it seems to be it seems to be a very good cluster in the maximization step. So now, after the maximization step, again it will go in expectation step. Considering these are the new centroids, if you recal, if you again iterate through the points and try to assign the points to the nearest centroids, now you will end up getting new clusters. Cluster one. Now cluster 2, okay, and then the cluster 3. So cluster 3, there won't be any change as of such because already they are very good clusters. And in the cluster 1, it has got all the points which are near to the centroid. And in the cluster 3, so these are the points which are all close to this centroid. Okay, again in the maximization step, again it will recalculate the centroids so if you recalculate the centroids here there won't be too much change in this point because now it looks like this cluster is already converged i mean it has already a good cluster because there is no major change maybe your cluster centroid might change a little bit like this but not too much of deviation but your centroid might change a little bit over here because already it seems to be the main of this whole points and it might remain still remain the same like this okay so when will this whole process will stop there will be a stopping condition there could be a couple of stopping conditions for the k-means algorithm so if there is no further movement in the centroids of the given clusters so if there is no too much uh, movement between the centroids from the previous step to the next step then the clusters has seems to be converged okay other ways you can also set the number of iterations to a hard-coded value say 10 20 like that so if the number of iterations are fixed to 10 and the clusters I mean the number of iterations are completed for 10 times automatically the clusters will assume that the clusters are converged so either you take a hard step using the number of iterations or let the algorithm decide whether the clusters have been converged after n number of iterations okay by the cluster center even though you set the n iterations i mean 
the number of iterations to your algorithm but still if the centroid moment is no more existing then the clusters will automatically get converged say after five iterations if the centroids are not moving beyond some threshold value then automatically the clusters will get converged guys okay so this is how the k means clustering algorithm works and this is why it is called as em kind of algorithm where in expectation step each point will be allocated to a nearest centroid and in the maximization step you will recalculate the centroid so that's how since it goes in iterations finally the algorithm will become converged guys so guys uh, this is what uh, expectation maximization there are two steps in this algorithm the two step algorithm is classic example of an em kind of algorithm expectation and maximization k means expectation step maximization step in iteration 1 and then in iteration 2 i mean the, in the second follow up iteration it will be again expectation and again maximization so it will go like that so on till the clusters are converged so in the em algorithm the two steps are processed repeatedly until the convergence is reached the first step known as expectation step finds the expected points associated with the cluster the second step known as maximization step improves the estimation of the cluster using the knowledge from the e step so in the second step maximization it will recalculate the cluster centroid curve so suppose we have n points that we need to cluster into k groups say groups one two three in the given uh, data set over here like this so this is the points and these are the cluster centroids like c1 c2 c3 these are randomly identified centroids from the algorithm and these points will get allocated to this this like this the points will get distributed in the step one so in the step one over here and in the step two the cluster centroids will be recalculated right so centroid will move from here to here it will move from here to here and it will move from here to here so then finally the if you repeat the slide 24 and 25 step until the clusters are converged on two two uh, stopping conditions one is hard coded value on the number of iterations the other one is the threshold value for the centroid movement so based on that uh, we can actually make sure that the, the algorithm will exit okay so this uh, this is how the, finally the clusters will get converged okay so guys representing the data as a vector so one of the questions you know i think uh, so guys as we already discussed in the first session vector will have both dimension and it will have a direction and as well as the as well as the magnitude okay so that's a mathematical definition of a vector but however in our terminology when we whenever we consider a vector so we can represent a uh, a point we can represent an observation with in the form of a vector okay so vector will have all the features associated with the point and guys what are the types of vectors we have discussed do you remember in uh, mahout it's not random vector i mean uh, sparse vector actually under sparse vector you have again two categories one is random access sparse vector and the sequential access sparse vector so these are the three different implementations of vectors available in mahout one is dense vector random access sparse vector and then sequential access sparse vector guys so please go back i know if you any one of you don't remember how this vectors works please go back to the first recording and please review it one more time because uh, the concept of vectors will be mostly used in, you know uh, from here onwards uh, to understand further concepts so guys another major aspects of running the algorithm itself is you know now that we understood the algorithm and uh, you know the properties of the algorithm k-means also and how k-means works also so the another important aspects is you know you guys should know how to use the algorithms so especially like uh, more, any of the algorithms you guys work with in the mahout or any other uh, any other machine learning uh, as uh, machine learning tools the key thing over here you see uh, you have to create the data in a format that the algorithm should understand so that's the key aspects of the system guys okay the primary aspect of the of running the algorithms so in order to make sure that uh, you know 
the data is in a format which the algorithms can understand. So here we will represent uh, all the features in the form of the vector guys. Okay. So those feature selection, you, you guys should be very careful about the feature selection uh, based upon the type of problem you guys deal with. Uh, once you identify the features which could yield better results, then uh, you guys have to represent it in the form of a vector and the vectors can be used for your algorithm for further training folks. Okay. So here I have taken a small slide, you know, to put some efforts to make you understand the, how the features can be extracted out of the input data sets. So in this uh, slide, you know, vectorization process, transforming the data into vectors. So the first thing we're going to learn is balls. So, okay, so here in, in this image, you guys can see three different balls. Balls of different sizes, colors need to be converted into appropriate vector form. The trick uh, here is to figure out how the different features of a ball translate into a decimal value. So here we'll put some efforts to translate, you know, the different features into some numeric values. Okay, so how we'll represent those numeric values? So set of balls of set of balls of different weight sizes and colors get converted into this form. So if you look at you know ball sizes, uh, shape and probably the color. So you guys can see here like first ball is like uh, say small, round and then green. So that can be transformed into weight. And uh, okay, so probably this is uh, you know the shape. I think uh, sorry. So this probably is weight. We are capturing the weight of the ball, color of the ball, and then the size of the ball. So color seems to be a numeric value. You guys know right? The color can be represented in the form of RGB. So red, green, blue. Uh, so that combination we have represented the value here as five one zero, and then size as uh, one for the say if it's a small one. Okay, so these three features like weight, color, and size can be represented in a vector like this. So like this, you can you know vectorize all these uh, objects into the actual vectors, which you can be able to use for further training, guys. Okay, so this is how we'll come up with the vectorization process. So the whole process, if you look at the entire process of you know. Uh, running the algorithm starting from scratch is into is divided into three phases. One is you have the raw data, convert the raw data into sequence files, and then the vectors. So sorry, this is not the entire process of running the algorithm. Rather, this is the vectorization process. So in the vectorization process, you have the raw data as your source, and you ex create the sequence files out of the raw data. The reason why we should create the sequence files because Mahout operates fine, I mean, very well on sequence files rather than the text files. So that's why you guys should compute, I mean, uh, create sequence files out of your raw data sets. So once you create sequence files, then you pass the sequence files to vectors, guys. Uh, sorry, using the sequence files, you will generate the vectors. Okay, does it make sense? So out of the sequence files. So, if you look at represent the features of an item as fields of one of the following vectors. So you have to represent the features of an item, I mean of an observation as the fields of a vector. So any one of these vectors you guys can use based on your requirement. Either it's a dense vector, or random access pass vector or sequential access pass vector. So mostly sequential random access or sequential access pass vector. The pass vectors are mostly used especially when you are dealing with very huge input feature set. For example, if you are trying to convert the, identify the groups within the documents, then the feature set will be very, very huge. So in such a scenario, it's better to use uh, sparse vectors rather than the dense vectors because dense vectors are fixed in length and each vector, even if the value is not available for a specific attribute, it will have some default value associated with it. Uh, but however, it's not the case for the sparse vector. Sparse vector is kind of, you know, a map where you have key value pair combinations and it does not have a fixed length. And then, you know, sequence files. So you have to create the sequence file input format with all, all this data. So you have to also create a sequence file output with all this data set so that you can pass the sequence files to your algorithm also. Okay. 
Sure. You can just read through some article specific to you know uh, this sequence files under Hadoop because that's come with the Hadoop itself. It's nothing to do with Mahout as of now. But however, Mahout is good at using that data because uh, using that uh, type of files because since it will be obviously dealing with large data sets, you know, working on text. Uh, plain text format will need lot a lot of storage space and a lot of memory and a lot of networking bandwidth to avoid all these things it operates on this uh, sequence files which is compressed in nature and it will take less space compared to that of the text files if the text file is taking around 20 uh, say gig it might take around like 12 or 13 gig space and also which will avoid the network bandwidth also 